start. Hi, hello everybody, and uh, welcome to this uh, this webinar where um, there's going to be a number of pre exciting, but brief, very brief presentations by the researchers in our risk inf at risk and information management research group. Um, and the session is being chaired by Morgan, so maybe she wants to say a few words as well. Hi everyone, it looks like we have about 10 of you so far. Um, uh, as Norman said, you'll just be hearing from um, 10 people from the risk group. Um, and I can go ahead and share with you if you'd like the order so everyone knows who they're listening to. Um, and you can look everyone up on the uh, risk and information website if you'd like to, and I can link that also in the chat. Um, so uh, without further ado, Mariana, are you ready? Yeah, yeah, I'm ready. Can you, can you see my screen now? No, not yet. Um, uh, are you able to see my screen? Hello? Oh, we can see it, yes. Yeah, yeah. Um, there are better way to. There is any way to close this. Is it okay if I present this way? Yep, that's perfect. Okay, uh, good morning everyone. My name is Mariana, I'm a PhD student. And my project is about using Bayesian networks for the and diabetes management support. This project is uh, part of a bigger project called Palm Bayesian, which is funded by EPSSC. My supervisors are uh, Dr. William Marsh and Professor Norman Fenton. So testosterone diabetes is a condition that uh, affects women uh, during pregnancy and it can occur any time during pregnancy and it causes uh, the blood cause levels to be uncontrolled. And if it left untreated, this condition can lead to uh, some pregnancy complications. For example, macrosomia, macrosomia which is when the uh, baby is born uh, over four kilos and uh, women with testosterone diabetes also can develop type 2 diabetes later uh, after the pregnancy. So the diagnostic of this condition uh, is uh, done mainly using blood glucose tests and women are at the beginning of the pregnancy stratified according to risk of developing uh, gestational diabetes using a set of risk factors. And throughout the pregnancies, they, they will be tested several times with blood glucose tests to check uh, if they are uh, positive or not. And after uh, being tested, when they are diagnosed as uh, just as another diabetes positive, uh, they, uh, they will be allocated to receive care in the at the hospital or at the clinics, midwifery clinics, depending on the risk. So we, uh, I propose to use uh, Bayesian networks uh, with uh, structure, this structure to define uh, the testing regime for uh, to, for women, pregnant women. So uh, at each stage of the pregnancy, um, we divided pregnancy into three stages, booking visit, early stage, which is before 20 weeks of pregnancy, and late stage, which as, is after 20 weeks of pregnancy. And uh, we use uh, the model to uh, input information available to decide whether the patient could be discharged or, or further testing 
should be referred to test to further testing. So, for example, a booking visit when only information about risk factors is available, uh, we can input the, if this information in this model. And using the model predictions, uh, the clinician can decide this patient doesn't need to be tested anymore. Uh, this, this patient should be tested early because it's a high risk patient, or this patient can be tested just later at the pregnancy. When uh, they are uh, diagnosed that positive, uh, all these women are structured to uh, follow a diet. Some of them uh, are diet control only, which means they don't just follow a diet during the pregnancy. Some of them need medication. And all of them need to uh, check their blood glucose levels four times a day after each meal and uh, when fasting as well. And they need to record these measurements and record whether they had a high carbohydrate meal and they exercise. And this, uh, this, this, this is recorded in a logbook, which we check uh, by the clinicians every fortnightly in general. Um, so uh, we, we propose to use a dynamic Bayesian network in which the patient would, would input information about their blood glucose level and whether they have a high carbohydrate meal and if they exercise or not. And this model, uh, using the model's projection, the predictions, we would be able to give this patient advice, whether they, she's fine and can continue self-management her condition, whether she imp should improve her diet and exercise, for example, or whether she should schedule an appointment. Uh, the same model, uh, an, a small extension of the same model can be used for patients on medication. And this, same, this patient would be inputting the same uh, information and add the information about medication. And uh, based on the model's prediction, uh, we could be giving advice to the patients uh, if they should self-management, if, can, if they can improve their diet, if they should increase, decrease or maintain their medication, if they should schedule appointment, or if they should call the host in case of any emergency. Yeah, so that's it. Uh, thank you for listening to me. All right. Um, so next, uh, we will have uh, Joshua, who is uh, also a PhD student. Good morning, everyone. My name is Joshua Hunt. I'm a PhD student in a risk and information management group at Queen Mary University of London. Today, I will talk about a novel method of product safety and risk assessment. Did you know that every year, there are hundreds of non-food products available on the market that pose a serious risk to the health and safety of consumers? In fact, in the past year, UK and EU regulators have identified approximately 2,000 products, including kitchen appliances, posing serious risks such as fire and physical injury. As consumers, we expect that the products we use are acceptably safe. To ensure our safety, regulators perform product risk assessment, which is an overall process of determining whether a product is safe for consumers to use. There are several methods of product risk assessment, including RIPEX, which is a primary method used in the UK and EU. Despite its widespread use, we have identified several limitations of RIPEX, including a limited approach to handling uncertainty, and it cannot assess the risk of novel products or products with little or no historical data. Given the limitations of RIPEX, the aim of my research is to develop a Bayesian network to provide an improved systematic method for product risk assessment that resolves the limitations with RIPEX. To do this, we met with the UK Government Office for Product Safety and Standards and reviewed literature to understand RIPEX and its limitations. Then using reusable Bayesian network fragments called idioms, we built a Bayesian network model for product risk assessment. This Bayesian network model resolves the limitations with RIPEX it informs risk management decisions and helps understand the effects of those decisions on consumer risk perception. 
The next phase of my research include consumer behavior surveys, which will inform and improve model predictions. And the last phase include developing a web-based tool for regulators and manufacturers to assess product risk, ensuring that the products we use are acceptably safe. Thank you. All right, thanks Joshua. And next we'll have uh, Yang Lu. Hi, I'm Yang. I'm also a second year PhD student in RIM Group. And today I want to present my recent work about improving based network structure learning and the presence of Melman Tyrell. So based network structure learning is a kind of method which aims to find the causal relationship between variables from the data and they will express these relationships by using a base network. So currently, most of the structure, uh, most of the structure learning algorithms are relying on a series of assumptions. For example, they normally assume the data are observed precisely, uh, which uh, means this, this data could trustly reflect the underlying population probability. However, this assumption is not very realistic because almost all measurement process involves some sort of uh, measurement error, and which is also the issue I I'm going to solve in this work. Uh, given our previous empirical experiments, uh, we have discovered that uh, only 5% of measurement error will reduce the accuracy of the structural learning algorithms by 10 to 30%, uh, which indicates that it is necessary for us to develop a solution to offset the inaccuracy caused by the material. And moreover, we also found that the material will lead structural learning algorithms to produce uh, more three vertex clicks compared with the number of such clicks in the true graphs and the graphs learned from our free data set. Uh, here, a three vertex click is a set of, is a set of three variables uh, in which each two of them are adjacent. So based on this phenomenon, I uh, proposed an algorithm called spurious age detection, which aims to remove those spurious ages that lead to those spurious three vertex clicks. And the basic idea for my algorithm is to search for a better fitting model by importing the monetary mechanism into the learn graph. So for example, assume this is a base network learned by a structure learning algorithm, which contains a three vertex click. And the set algorithm will firstly uh, compute the goodness of fit between this learned graph and the underlying uh, and, the, and the observed data. Uh, here, I use the BIC score as the metric of the good of feed. And then the set algorithm will try to introduce an additional variable called CO uh, as, a, as a child of C, which uh, is used for simulating the Mount Harrow on variable C. And at the same time, it will also remove the age between F and G because based on our theory, this age might be caused by the Mount Harrow on C. So in other words, this new reconstructed graph represents a possible underlying ground truth graph by assuming the moment error is on C. And again, the set algorithm will compute the BIC score for this new graph. And uh, if this graph could uh, produce a higher BIC score than the original graph, it means it could fit the data better and the, rem and the removed age F to G is likely to be spurious. So similarly, the set algorithm could apply the same process on the other two variables in these three vertex clicks, and it will eventually identify the age with the maximal BIC score as the spurious and remove it from the learned base network. So this is the basic workflow of my algorithm, and I have applied this algorithm by, uh, on four different structured learning algorithms, and the results show that uh, the set algorithm can generally improve the performance of these four algorithms uh, when there is more material on the data set and it won't decrease the performance when the data is clean so that people won't need to uh, check whether their data is, uh, uh, is cooperating with more material by applying this method. Uh, so that's it. Thank you very much. Sorry, I was muted. Um, all right, thank you. And uh... Next, uh, we will be hearing about um, 
the white box machine learning, Bayesian network structure discovery with uh, latent variables. Yep. Okay, hi everyone. My name is Gyat Kun Chopham. I'm the second year of PhD student from Bayesian Artificial Intelligence Research Lab with an information management research group. I am to talk about my topic, Bayesian Network Structure Learning in the percent of Latin variable. Um, the Bayesian Networks is the generative model, which it has the great advantage compared to the neural network because the Bayesian Network can be interpretable because there is the cause and effect relationship between the variables. So um, the Bayesian network with the large variable is the challenging topic. If you look at the definition of the large variables, the large variable represent the variable that are missing from the data set. For example, the squad stability in the football match or the gene for the intelligence. The problem is the large variable that are the common cause from the uh, variables or we call the large and confounder. It might create some spirit relationship. So here I will present the example for the basic network that it is generated from the experts. So you can see that the gray variables here, it is the large and variable. So my question is, in terms of machine learning perspective, how we could learn the structure of the basic network from the data set. So we propose the bidirected edges that can represent the Latin confounder here. For example, if A is the Latin confounder and it is the common cause of the observed variables B and C, so we could draw the directed edge, bidirected edges between B and C. So the model can represent confounding effect. I propose CCHM operations that it could learn the Bayesian network structure with the large variables. The step of the CCHM algorithms consists of two phases. First step, first step the algorithm will read the data set and then it generate the skeleton of the graph, which the skeleton is the underrated graph. For the next phase, the algorithm will try to orientate the directions which the direction could be directed edges or bidirected edges. So finally, the algorithm will produce this output graph as the Bayesian network structure. You can see the detail for CCHM algorithm in the conference paper in the reference in the uh, slide. Thank you. Okay, thank you. And next is uh, Mohammed. Yeah. I just share this. can see my screen, yeah? Okay, uh, my name is Mohamed Baroni. I'm a PhD student. Uh, today I'm going to talk through uh, my recent work on a model called FDCM, which is a generalizable uh, uh, concept-based model for effective medical ranking. As you all know, medical concepts such as drugs and symptoms have been widely used in uh, in the ranking task and retrieving biomedical documents. However, uh, consolidating both tests and concepts into, into the ranking task effectively is, is challenging. We propose a new aggregation parameter to combine the scores of uh, tab-based and concept-based well-known uh, DCM model. We define a semantic, we define semantic IDF as the difference of conceptual and term-based IDF scores. 
And we found, this, uh, found a strong correlation between the performance of conceptual DCM and semantic IDF among, amongst all, all the semantic uh, features that we looked into. That helped us to develop the linear aggregation parameter for FDCM model. And uh, regarding the results and conclusion, we tested our final uh, model on three medical data sets. And uh, the FDCM outperformed state of the art models. Also, and here, and here you see the effectiveness of the, uh, uh, we, we plotted the effectiveness of FDCM across a range of 150 queries. Uh, and, the, uh, and here you see the, uh, the performance of an individual query. You see that the combined model uh, outperform both a uh, concept only and term only model. As a conclusion, we, pre we presented uh, FTCM for dealing with the problem of varying performance of uh, concept only IR and bringing both concepts and terms into, into a reliable framework. And also, uh, we, 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 we think that this will help us to establish conceptual standards for, the, uh, for retrieving medical documents. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, and next, I think we have Thomas. Yeah, share my slides up. Can you see my slides? Uh, you can see my slides, yeah? Yep. Yes. Yep. So I'm going to talk about a uh, recent paper I wrote uh, with Thomas Royalke, who's my supervisor, uh, for a workshop at CIGAR called Information Content-Based Field Weighting for BN25F. So the kind of starting point with this is that a lot of the data collections you need, we need to search nowadays within kind of companies or anything really, uh, tend to have multiple fields per document. So you'll have kind of product name, product description, and so on. Uh, and a lot of the kind of common methods that deal with these kinds of uh, retrieval tasks, uh, so multi-field retrieval tasks, use some kind of a weighted sum over the fields. So you'll give a certain amount of weight the product name, a certain amount of product description. Uh, so probably the best known and most common of these is the BM25F, which is basically uh, a multi-field version of the BM25 retrieval model. Uh, then on the other side, uh, information theory, things like entropy and expected value are common in kind of various areas of IR. And what we did in this paper and kind of what I'm working on in general is kind of using this information theory things within multi-field retrieval and especially kind of defining these weights. So what we did with this is we created this new model called BN25FIC uh, and FIC stands for field information content. Uh, so it's basically an automatic method that estimates appropriate weights for each field. Uh, so the weights are calculated directly from kind of collection statistics. So this doesn't involve any kind of learning, uh, which is makes it quite fast compared to a lot of the other uh, models like the BN25F, where you do need to learn the field weights. Uh, the kind of special thing about this model is that field weights aren't defined for like a whole field at a time. So say the abstract of a document can have a high weight for the one document and query pair, whereas another document abstract would get a low weight. So it's kind of, it's quite flexible like that. Uh, experimental results were quite good. So there's quite a large increase in MAP and P at 10. Uh, however, it's worth noting that 
these relative improvements were against basically a non-weighted BM25F where we didn't uh, learn the kind of optimal field weights. And that was just because the BM25FIC doesn't require any learning. So it made sense to compare it to a non-learned model as well. Uh, we're kind of going beyond that at the moment, but so far this is what we've done. And then as an extra, there was also, we made this interactive, so, uh, suggested this interactive model where these BM25FIC field weights that we obtain from the model uh, are used to navigate the search results in kind of more an interactive way where you pick a document and then you can look for documents that are relevant in similar ways or different ways, uh, etc. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. And next we'll have uh, Dr. Guo. Thank you, Moki. Uh, good morning. The to uh, my name is Trico Guo, and uh, the topic of my presentation is structural learning of high dimensional base network. This work has been done with Anthony Constantino. So base network is a probabilistic uh, graphical model and uh, it includes uh, structure and parameters. So structural learning of uh, a base network can be understood to learn you see, the arrows. Uh, and uh, for example, uh, uh, the, the variable a and C, A is the parent, C is the child. Or we see A is the cause, Y C is the effect. So structural learning of this network is empty hard. And uh, when we have thousands or tens of thousands of variable, it's difficult to learn the structure. So structural learning based on ordering and CPS is uh, efficient and skills to large networks. And this is an example of uh, and ordering. Look at the first two variables or nodes. The first node is possible to be the parent of the second node, but it is impossible to be the child node of the second node. And for each node, we have a lot of CPS or candidate parent sets. And in each set, uh, we have uh, possible parents for the node. And each node is related to uh, a score, or we see the post rear uh, probability. So structural learning is, find, is to find the optimal score combination of CPS. And of course, we, 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 we have to make sure the graph is back, is not cycle. The number of CPS increase with the number of uh, exponentially significantly with the number of nodes and also the maximum number of parents. So it's really hard to learn the uh, structure of thousands of variables. And we propose uh, a very simple but uh, effective strategy. So we, we will not use all the CPS uh, from each node, but we will use part of it Actually, they are a very promising CPS. So in this way, we reduce the total amount of CPS for structural learning and make the structural learning of large network solvable. And this is uh, part of the results. Our data set with 500 variables or almost 900 variables, we learn the same I mean, compared with the standard method, we learned the same accuracy uh, structure by saving almost 90% time or 80% time. This work has been published on Journal of Entropy and we are developing a parallel sampling algorithm. Um, yeah, thank you. Thanks, Dr. Guo. And um, next, uh, I will be sharing my screen. All right. Right. 
Can everyone see the slides? Hopefully. Okay. Yeah. Um, so, hi, my name is Morgan. Um, I'm also a PhD student in the risk group. Um, and my work focuses on um, evaluating risk factors for multiple sclerosis. And uh, just a background on the different kinds of risk factors, there's genetic risks and environmental risks that both are thought to lead to the development of multiple sclerosis. So the reason we need a Bayesian network approach uh, mainly deals with how risk factors are currently being evaluated, uh, not just for MS, but for um, most diseases. So for MS, for example, it has unknown etiology, so we do not know what truly causes it. So the way we model risk factors is normally done with odds ratios, uh, which is the epidemiological standard. Uh, so you basically have a lot of risk factors that are assessed as independent risk factors. So um, normally there's not um, dependencies that are uh, taken into account for all the different risk factors that might contribute to MS. Um, so you can see that on the right, the model on the right is what the equivalent model for an odds ratio would be. Uh, whereas on the left, um, which is the more useful model, is the Bayesian network approach that shows all the uh, interdependencies between risk factors. So if we use this approach, we can get a, a fuller perspective of what might truly cause MS and also the different effects, which we in turn can uh, model different interventions on MS. So in this uh, sample model here, um, you can see that there's a lot of different risk factors that contribute. And by modeling it in this way, we can see what all the dependencies are um, between all the risk factors. And therefore, if we observe, for example, in this model, um, that medical care access is low, in a specific area, um, we can see what the effect has on MS prevalence. So by making this fuller model, um, we can see what all of the factors are that are contributing and uh, assess all of these in terms of dependencies and less on, um, in a way that models everything as an independent risk factor. So for example, you can see up here that um, ethnicity is one risk factor for MS, but you can see that it also causes a, a cascade, um, which in turn affects your, for example, vitamin D levels, which is thought to be a risk factor for MS, having low vitamin D levels. Um, but you can see how some of the dependencies uh, might show that, um, might have intermediate risk factors that um, we are not seeing uh, based on the uh, current way that we're modeling uh, risk factors. All right. Um, and next uh, is Ali. Yes, I'm going to share my screen. You can see my screen, right? Um, yes. Thank you. My name is Ali Fahmi. I'm a PhD student in uh, Risk and Information Management Group on the supervision of uh, Dr. William Marsh. I'm going to present my research on Bayesian networks for manage, managing rheumatoid arthritis. As you may know, rheumatoid arthritis is a chronic inflammatory and autoimmune condition, causes swollen and tender and painful joints and um, may affect psychosocial aspects of life and quality of life of patients. Therefore, they need to be supported for 
self-management and treatment of their condition. Um, our suggestion is to uh, develop a decision support with causal Bayesian networks in it, uh, and um, therefore assist uh, clinicians and patients in treatment and self-management of the condition. Uh, you may know that Bayesian networks are uh, directed uh, acyclic graphs and um, they have uh, random variables and um, causal and associational connections, dependencies between those variables and underlying those uh, variables are conditional probabilities. On the right hand side you can see the simple Bayesian network uh, which has variables B and C conditionally dependent on variable A. Uh, using those uh, principles for Bayesian network modeling, uh, we have created a couple of Bayesian networks. You can see two of them in this slide. Uh, these are, of course, abstract uh, models. I didn't put the real models because I don't want to go into details, but uh, the model is uh, the structure is like uh, is as you can see here on the very right side uh, left side you can see the diagnosis model for rheumatoid arthritis um, the variable v x represents um, diagnosis and differentiates um, rheumatoid arthritis cases from other inflammatory arthritis cases and on top of the model uh, is the risk factors and in the bottom is signs symptoms serology and comorbidities um, that are creating similar symptoms and serologies. So risk factors, signs, symptoms, serology, and comorbidities are being observed, are given to the model, and diagnosis uh, uh, predicts, the, the DX predicts the diagnosis. On the uh, right side, you see another abstract model, uh, for a dynamic Bayesian network model, actually, uh, for self-management and treatment of uh, uh, rheumatoid arthritis. Variable DS uh, is uh, standing for, um, DS stands for uh, disease state, and uh, represents the disease activity or disease state um, by, by, ob by observing serology results, symptoms and signs in the bottom of the uh, model, as you can see. And also, we consider flare-ups, uh, which are not being usually considered in uh, current clinical uh, practice. And we try to prescribe, we, we are not prescribing, we, we are trying to consider treatment of TX, variable TX in the model, uh, to keep the disease state under control. I, I forgot to mention that there, there are time slices. As you can see, the model repeats. Uh, so DS1, then DS2, and all those indices are being uh, uh, repeated uh, after in each time slice. I mean. And finally, uh, we are still hoping, we're still working on this, and we hope uh, to present a, a promising results from this uh, set monitoring model. Thank you. All right. And then uh, last, we have uh, Dr. Joyner. Okay. Can you see my screen? Uh, okay. Uh, <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, I'm Chris. I'm a postdoc working with William Marsh uh, in conjunction with a number of physiotherapists from Myland Hospital. So, what we've been aiming to do is develop knowledge driven models for the treatment of patients with lower back pain coming into primary care. The main aim is to help GPs and so forth better understand the problem and make better decisions about which treatment path to send the patients on. 
So what we wanted to do was um, invite a lot of experts to come and help us develop this, um, this uh, knowledge-driven model. The main problem is that um, back pain itself, like many other medical conditions, is an extremely complex problem with many potential relevant factors that could be included. Um, the other problem we have is that these experts that we wanted to bring in, they have minimal experience in terms of um, trying to build these models or estimating probabilities. And they also have very little time, you know, in which to spare, you know, they're full-time professionals. Um, so our challenge or our solution was to try and come up with an elicitation process that was able to extract as much knowledge as possible while reducing the burden on the uh, participants to, um, to, to come up with this knowledge. So obviously I don't have much time to, to present the details. I'll just present you a couple of pictures and try and explain what we were trying to do. Um, so in the end, we, we came up with a, a Delphi process. So the idea was that um, the participants would first give some, um, some knowledge, answer some questions, and then come back later to discuss these within a workshop. So in each stage, we came up with, or we designed a bespoke online tool um, where the participants could um, come and enter the information interactively. So for example, for the variables and the factors, they were able to um, add which variables they wanted and then drag and drop them into the various categories and things like this, and then rank them in the various order. And for example, for the probabilities which needed to go into the Bayesian network, we designed little um, interfaces depending on what kind of variable um, was actually being elicited. So they're able to quickly realize what variable was there and give a visual estimation of what the probabilities were interactively. Um, after the elicitation, we essentially got all the, all the data and tried to pass that into one huge model of uh, a Bayesian network. Um, and what we have resulted in, in is um, a Bayesian network, which has focused on looking at um, serious underlying pathologies of uh, conditions associated to lower back pain. I mean, uh, our intention was this was always to be a rough model. And so the next steps are to uh, test the model a bit more, evaluate it with the participants and um, then to potentially extend this to um, less serious lower back pain problems or other MSK problems like knee, shoulder, et cetera. Okay, thank you.